When we talk about the regulation of blood pressure, there's many factors that go in. But keep in mind, all of those factors are supervised by the brain. And in order to maintain proper blood pressure, it requires the entire body to work together. It requires the cooperation of the heart, the blood vessels, and the kidneys as well. So there's a lot that goes in to maintain blood pressure. So the three most important factors to maintain this blood pressure are the cardiac output, which you know should be five to six liters per minute at rest, the total peripheral resistance that the body um, has, and also the blood volume. And so what we can, can think of this as the pressure is equal to the cardiac output, the peripheral resistance, and the blood volume. So they're all directly related. So it's important to remember this um, relationship here. And so let's go through this a little slowly so as uh, hopefully it doesn't get too confusing. So first of all, the F stands for the blood flow, and that's directly proportionate to the blood pressure. And again, the reason the R is underneath as the denominator is because it's inversely related to both of these. So essentially, as the resistance increases, and the pressure also has to re increase to um, account for that increase in resistance. So if we, if we substitute cardiac output for the blood flow, because they're directly related, this is just telling us simply that the cardiac output is directly related to blood pressure. And again, the resistance is what opposes that. So the change in pressure is directly equal to cardiac output times the resistance. So essentially what this is showing us is that blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure is directly proportional to the cardiac output and the peripheral resistance. So that means if there's a change in one variable, that is quickly compensated by changes in other variables as well. So for example, in order to compensate for a drop in cardiac output, there would be an increase in blood pressure as kind of a compensatory mechanism. So the regulation of blood pressure is, as we've already learned, that the cardiac output is equal to the stroke volume times the heart rate, and therefore the mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times the resistance, and as a result, all of them are related. Stroke volume, heart rate, and the resistance as well. So basically, anything that increases the stroke volume, the heart rate, or the resistance, any of those, will also increase the mean arterial pressure. Because that mean arterial pressure has to, has to compensate for an increase in any of these three variables. Stroke volume, heart rate, or resistance. So let's look at those three variables a little more. The first one, the stroke volume, it's affected by the end diastolic volume. So now you know that the D means diastolic, it's the filling phase of the heart, and the, it would be equivalent to the venous return. The heart rate, it's maintained by the medullary centers, that's directly in the medulla, in the brain stem, and finally, the resistance is most affected by the vessel diameter. So again, when the diameter decreases, the resistance increases. So the factors that control all of these, there's two main groups. There's short-term regulation and there's long-term regulation. The short-term regulation means that there are either chemicals released as, from the nerves or from as hormones that control blood pressure. There's also long-term blood pressure controls from the kidney. So the factors that increase that affect all of this mean arterial pressure now are shown in this flow chart. In this flow chart, first of all, we have seen this before, the stroke volume and the heart rate. We multiply those two to get the cardiac output. 
and now what we're adding in is just another variable. That's the total periphery resistance. And so you should know that the total periphery resistance are affected by the diameter of the blood vessels. So again, that means if we decrease the diameter of the blood vessels, if there's vasoconstriction, like in the arterioles, that increases total periphery resistance. Also, in the case of blood viscosity, that's the thickness of the blood, the thicker the blood is, that's also going to increase total peripheral resistance also. So examples of that would be polycythemia or blood doping. And the third variable is the total blood vessel length. So in that case, the blood vessel length is increased by hypertension, obesity, factors such as that. So the short-term regulation, we're going to first look at the neural controls. And the neural controls are um, two main neural mechanisms that control peripheral resistance. The, master, or the mean arterial pressure is maintained by altering the blood vessel diameter, which alters the resistance. So again, if blood volume drops, the vessels are going to suddenly constrict. And so this is a way to compensate to help to increase the mean arterial pressure. So neural controls, they operate via reflex arcs. So where there's a stimulus and there's a response. And the first example is the cardiovascular center of the medulla oblongata in the brainstem. There's also receptors. There's called baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors, chemoreceptors, and then, of course, higher brain centers. So, for example, the, the cerebral cortex, the, you know, higher brain centers could also affect this. But at the level of the cardiovascular center, there's a cluster of sympathetic neurons in the medulla that consists of cardioinhibitory and cardioacceleratory centers. Essentially, the cardioinhibitory centers are the brakes and the cardioacceleratory center would be the gas. And so the vasomotor center, it sends impulses via sympathetic efferents called vas vasomotor fibers to blood vessels. And this is called vasomotor tone. So what's important to know is that there are input from baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and also higher brain centers. So let's look at the baroreceptors first. The baroreceptors are located in um, places that are close to the heart and are going to sense increases in blood pressure. So the first location is the carotid sinus. The next one is the aortic arch and also walls of large arteries of the neck and the thorax. So when the mean arterial pressure is high, that increased blood pressure stimulates these baroreceptors to increase input to the vasomotor center. Therefore, if the pressure is high, it inhibits the vasomotor center and the cardioacceleratory centers, stimulating the cardioinhibitory center, thus decreasing blood pressure. So it's kind of a negative feedback loop where you have an increase in blood pressure and we end up with a decrease in blood pressure in response to that. Now, as far as the vasomotor center, there's vasodilation that is decreased output from the vasomotor center to lower blood pressure. So we can see that it decreases venous return, thus decreasing cardiac output. In a normal functioning heart, the venous return, what's coming into the right atrium, should be equivalent to what's going out of the heart, out of the left ventricle. So the other short-term regulation in the neural reflexes in the case of having a decreased cardiac output, there's impulses to the cardiac center that inhibit the sympathetic nervous system and stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest portion, re thus reducing heart rate and contractility. We're called that heart rate and contractility are directly related. 
if the mean arterial pressure is low, that means that there's a reflex vasoconstriction initiated to increase cardiac output and also blood pressure. And those examples would be in the carotid sinus reflex and also the aortic reflex. Now these are two important responses that are very sensitive to blood pressure fluctuations in the body. So let's look at the feedback that occurs here. The feedback occurs first as the, for example, if this, in the stimulus, if the blood pressure rises above the normal range, that's going to be sensed by baroreceptors located in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. So that's proximal, very close to the heart. So we have um, impulses from the baroreceptors that stimulate the brakes of the body, basically. We want to slow the heart rate down. So it um, decreases sympathetic impulses to lower heart rate, contractility, and cardiac output. So in this case, the, it, the rate of vasomotor impulses decreases to cause vasodilation, thus decreasing total periphery resistance. And then the final result is finally a decrease in cardiac output, decrease in total peripheral resistance, and we're back in homeostasis. The opposite end of this occurs if there's a sudden drop in blood pressure as well. That's going to be sensed by the baroreceptors in the cardiac sinus and aortic arch. There's that decrease in baroreceptors is going to activate the cardioacceleratory center. So the gas, essentially, is going to increase sympathetic impulses to the heart rate, increase contractility, increase cardiac output. Also, the vasomotor fibers are going to cause vasoconstriction, thus increasing peripheral resistance. Again, remember when we decrease the diameter of the blood vessel, we increase resistance. So the end result is the cardiac output is an increased and the total peripheral resistance increases just as well. So the next example of short-term reflexes regulation would be the chemoreceptor reflexes. And in the example of the chemoreceptor reflexes, there's the aortic arch and large arteries. They're now going to detect increases in carbon dioxide, drops in pH or oxygen. And so chemo means chemical, so that should be pretty straightforward. This is very important because the level of oxygen and carbon dioxide always has to be at a certain level the partial pressure of these gases. So cardi um, carbon dioxide, when it increases, the pH goes down and the oxygen level goes down. So if the carbon dioxide increases, the cardioacceleratory center is activated to increase cardiac output. Vasomotor center causes vasoconstriction and the body can get rid of this excess carbon dioxide to get us back into balance. These reflexes are also found in the medulla in the brain stem as well, but also higher levels, higher brain center, centers above the brain stem can also regulate this, like the hypothalamus and the cerebral cortex can modify arterial pressure. And we know that the hypothalamus is is very intimately involved with stress, and this is one factor that happens during stress. There's also hormonal controls that can play a role with short-term regulation here. And the short-term hormonal controls are the adrenal medulla hormones, and the adrenal medulla hormones are epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal gland. Both of these are vasoconstrictors. So they increase carbon dioxide and cause vasoconstriction. So what's important to remember from this slide specifically is that aldosterone, epinephrine, norepinephrine, ADH, thyroxine, 
all are going to increase blood pressure. And that goes the same with angiotensin 2. So all increase blood pressure, they cause vasoconstriction. The only one that decreases blood pressure is atrial natriuretic peptide. And atrial natriuretic peptide decreases blood pressure by antagonizing aldosterone, decreasing blood volume. And what atrial natriuretic peptide does is it causes excretion of sodium and water. And so the long-term regulation of blood pressure we'll talk about coming up, and that has to do more with the kidney. So the next slide shows a chart here just to summarize these various chemicals that we just talked about. And first of all, there is epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the summary here is that both of those increase blood pressure and they increase heart rate contractility and increase total peripheral resistance through vasoconstriction. Angiotensin II also increases blood pressure, increases total peripheral resistance, vasoconstriction. ADH increases blood pressure. It does it through a little bit of a different mechanism, and that is to increase blood volume by decreasing water loss, decreasing the amount that we urinate. Aldosterone also increases blood pressure, and it increases it by decreasing salt and water loss. So the last one is the only one, again, that's going to decrease blood pressure. It does this by increasing salt and water loss and causing vasodilation. So vasodilation, is you should associate that with uh, decreasing blood pressure and vasoconstriction, you should associate that with increasing blood pressure.